It's morning, June 18th, 2023. Five individuals are seated inside a submersible named Titan, initiating a descent into the ocean. Their objective is to explore the sunken remains of the Titanic, a ship of historical significance that had sunken into the sea around a century ago. This form of adventure tourism is notably exclusive, with each occupant having invested over $250,000 for just a few hours of exploration. However, the steep cost is attributed to the Titanic's concealed location, precisely 3,810 meters below the ocean surface. As the submersible Titan embarks on its underwater journey, it requires about two hours to reach a depth of 3,810 meters. Unlike a conventional self-powered submarine that possesses the ability to autonomously navigate in and out of the sea through dedicated ports, the submersibles lack independent functionality. To immerse and retrieve a submersible, the assistance of a support ship becomes indispensable. In this context, the Polar Prince plays the pivotal role of the support ship, orchestrating and overseeing every aspect of the submersible's venture. Every 15 minutes during its descent, the submersible transits a signal to the support ship stationed on the sea's surface. This also serves as their exclusive communication link with the outside world. However, on the fateful day of June 18th, just one hour and 45 minutes into its dive, the Titan suddenly loses contact with the Polar Prince. Like this video and subscribe to the channel as we unravel what happens next to the human body when a submarine implodes. Despite the initial communication blackout, a glimmer of hope persisted because there was time until 4.30 p.m. for the Titan to resurface independently. This was because in the event that the submersible became lodged underwater, passengers had a potential solution. They could tilt it from inside, maneuvering it back and forth to facilitate ascent. This could be achieved by strategically removing the ballasts, those weighty tanks filled with oceanic water. At 4.30 p.m., as the anticipated moment for Titans resurfacing came and passed without a sign of the submersible, an air of concern settled in the support ship. After a brief period of waiting, the decision was made to escalate the situation. At 7.10 p.m., the U.S. Coast Guard was notified. The urgency was underscored by a grim reality. Inside the Titan, only a scant 96 hours worth of oxygen remained. With just four days on the clock, any rescue operation had a narrow window to locate the passengers alive. In maritime emergencies, vessels are often equipped with an emergency position, indicating radio beacon that aids in locating distressed ships. Fortunately, the Titan did not carry this life-saving device. Compounding the challenge was the realization that even if the Titan had somehow made its way back to the sea's surface, the passengers inside faced a dire fate due to depleting oxygen levels. The submersible lacked any means of internal access. Its door could only be secured and opened from the outside. So whether submerged or resurfaced, those critical four days became a race against not just the depth of the ocean, but against time itself. Furthermore, the search zone extended over an expansive 25,000 square kilometers. Imagine the daunting challenge of locating a minivan-sized submersible within an area 71 times larger than Las Vegas. Yet despite the immense scale, Rescue teams risked their lives in pursuit of the missing Titan. The operation commenced with two American and two Canadian aircrafts, employing sonar technology to detect signals beneath the waves. Initially, three ships scoured the surface, but as time elapsed, additional vessels joined the search. Remote-operated vehicles were also deployed in an attempt to uncover any traces. Regrettably, despite concerted efforts, no sign of the submersible or the passengers emerged. An optimism for a safe return dwindled. Four days into the search on June 22nd, an ROV scanned the ocean floor, stumbled upon debris, approximately 490 meters from the Titanic's bow. Confirmation arrived with a heavy heart. The submersible had fractured, and the lives within it were tragically lost. On the same day, the U.S. Coast Guard, in a press conference, confirmed the implosion of the Titan due to extreme pressure. Oceanographic Aspects of the Atlantic Water However, one lingering question dominated headlines for weeks. What transpired with those passengers? Well, to unravel this mystery, we must delve deep into the oceanographic aspects of the Atlantic water bodies. The location where this submersible vanished is situated in the Atlantic Ocean, approximately 600 kilometers from Newfoundland, a Canadian island. 
In this particular spot, hidden within the ocean's depths, rests the fragmented wreckage of the Titanic. The bow and the stern, now separated, lie roughly 800 meters apart from each other. To grasp the daunting depth of 3,800 meters, let's refer to a chart provided by the Washington Post. To put things in perspective, the iceberg that collided with the Titanic protruded 100 feet above the water's surface, extending several times deeper underwater. Recreational scuba divers limited to a maximum depth of 130 feet can only explore a fraction of the ocean's vastness. Beyond 650 feet begins a twilight zone, where only a minimal amount of light can penetrate the depths. After 1,000 feet, the area is marked by the deepest ever underwater rescue operation conducted at 1,600 feet. Descending further, a midnight zone begins after 3,800 feet, where absolute darkness prevails as the sunlight fails to reach this depth. Delving even deeper at 6,600 feet lies the area where the main wreckage of the Atom aircraft, a tragic Boeing 737 plane crash in 2007, was recovered. Continuing the descent to 12,500 feet, we can eventually reach the ocean floor, the resting place of the Titanic. At this depth, the pressure is an astonishing 378 times that at the surface, necessitating meticulous submersible design. However, the Titan's design, rather than following a meticulous approach, was inherently experimental. Notably, the glass providing a view to the outside world held the record as the largest viewport ever installed in any private submersible. The core structure known as the hull featured a composition of carbon fiber, a departure from the conventional materials of steel, titanium, or aluminum, typically used in submarines. And as if it wasn't enough, this venture into such depths of the ocean marked the first time anyone had examined the properties of carbon fiber under extreme aquatic pressures. Regrettably, the outcome of this disaster suggests that carbon fiber might not be a suitable material for this specific use case. On the seafloor, despite the havoc, the caps made of titanium remained unscathed. In contrast, the main body, constructed from carbon fiber, now lay scathed in fragments, serving as a testament to the unpredictable nature of experimental designs in the unforgiving depths of the ocean. The catastrophic implosion. Yet as we contemplate the submersible's fate, a stark question arises. What happens to a human body when a submarine implodes? Envision the rapid popping of an air balloon when punctured. It disappears in a mere second. A similar occurrence unfolds beneath the ocean, but in the opposite direction at an extremely accelerated pace. The term catastrophic implosion stands exactly opposite of an explosion. It describes a scenario where external forces converge with such immense intensity from all directions, causing an object to collapse inward, reminiscent of the way a soda can crumbles when compressed. Interestingly, even the most minor flaw or dent in a submarine structure can create a vulnerable point susceptible to the overwhelming pressure exerted by the surrounding water. To comprehend this phenomenon, our focus must turn to the pivotal factor of pressure. Whenever an object submerges beneath the water surface, it contends with pressure pressing against it from every conceivable direction, creating a uniform force on all sides. As we delve deeper, this pressure amplifies significantly as aforementioned reaching a staggering 378 times, the pressure experienced at the ocean surface when reaching the ocean bed. This subaquatic pressure known as hydrostatic pressure amplifies in strength as more water layers itself above, imposing a formidable force. Contrary to that, our human physiology is poorly adapted to withstand such immense levels of extreme pressure, especially when subjected to sudden and drastic changes. Human body's tolerance against pressure. On average, the human body can handle pressure of up to 50 pounds per square inch. However, at the deepest point of the ocean, the Mariana Trench, which reaches a depth of approximately 11,000 meters, the pressure is equivalent to a staggering 15,750 pounds per square inch. To comprehend the enormity of this pressure, consider the sensation of having a hundred elephants standing on your head. That's the level of pressure one would experience at the ocean depth. Similarly, a person standing next to the Titanic shipwreck would endure a force of 6,000 pounds per square inch, which is nearly 120 times greater than the body's typical tolerance. Consequently, the body's various systems suffer immediate and catastrophic danger simultaneously. BBC Earth Lab conducted an experiment to illustrate the impact of pressure on the human body. Two volunteers were placed inside an artificial pressure chamber, where a balloon shaped like a human filled with air was also present. This chamber was artificially subjected to high pressure, simulating conditions akin to descending toward the Earth's core. 
At the outset of the experiment, the balloon rapidly shrank in size. However, due to their human physiology, the volunteers' bodily fluids initially pushed their organs outward, resisting the pressure. But as they descended to a depth of only 14 kilometers, they encountered such intense pressure that it caused their voices to shift to a higher pitch. Subsequently, one of the volunteers attempted to solve basic math problems, but the immense pressure on the internal organs made it challenging. Nevertheless, it's crucial to note that this was a demonstration of air pressure beneath the Earth's surface. The situation becomes significantly more severe when we consider water pressure. For example, if we contemplate the scenario of the Titan submersible, which experienced a catastrophic collapse at the depth of 3,800 meters, that is 3.5 times shallower than the depth reached by the volunteers beneath the Earth's surface. The consequences were far more staggering. This collapse took place at an astonishing velocity of approximately 1,500 miles per hour, or 2,414 kilometers per hour, completing the implosion in just one millisecond. To provide some context, consider that the human brain typically reacts to visual stimuli in just 13 milliseconds, whereas a general stimuli takes approximately 25 milliseconds to elicit a response. Moreover, the entire process of perceiving and responding rationally usually takes between 150 to 200 milliseconds. This starkly highlights that the implosion on the Titan occurred between 13 and 200 times faster than the brain's capacity to process information. Likewise, the human brain processes information related to pain in approximately 100 milliseconds, which is nearly 99 times longer than the duration of the implosion event. In light of these time disparities, it becomes evident that the unfortunate individuals aboard the Titan had no chance to comprehend or experience the unfolding events. The events transpired too swiftly for the brain to even register or transmit pain signals, ultimately resulting in a painless demise. The hypothetical timeline? Submersible's implosion in one millisecond. However, based on the speculations, we can draw a series of hypothetical events that would have happened in that one millisecond. Though the passengers were not able to experience it, still it helps us understand the catastrophic event step by step. In the first fleeting moments from 0 to 0 0.1 milliseconds, the implosion would have initiated with sudden and startling abruptness, potentially ignited by either a structural flaw or an external force bearing down upon it. This abrupt alteration in pressure would have triggered a cascading chain of events, instigating the submarine's dramatic inward collapse. From 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 milliseconds as the harrowing implosion continued, its inexorable progression, the internal pressure would undergo a near instantaneous and dramatic decrease. Within the confines of the submarine, every pocket of air including that held within the passenger's lungs and other air-containing spaces would undergo rapid expansion. This violent expansion would inflict immediate and grievous harm upon the delicate tissues it encountered, intensifying the cataclysmic nature of the event. Between 0.2 to 0.4 milliseconds, the phenomenon of barotrauma would have exerted its toll on the passengers' well-being, impacting their ears, sinuses, and lungs. The swiftness of the pressure change would have subjected them to a harrowing experience, inflicting excruciating pain as the air spaces within their bodies grappled desperately to equalize with the unforgiving external pressure. Advancing to 0.4 to 0.6 milliseconds, the relentless progression of the implosion would have taken a further toll on the submersible's structural integrity. The immense force exerted on the passengers would have intensified, inflicting profound internal injuries as their delicate organs and tissues succumbed to the overwhelming external pressure. Following that, the heart would have struggled to pump blood against the increasing external pressure, spanning from 0.6 to 0.8 milliseconds. Cardiovascular failure would have set in as blood circulation faltered, resulting in the rapid onset of unconsciousness and potentially leading to cardiac arrest. Moving on to 0.8 to 0.9 milliseconds, the absurd decompression would have triggered a series of harrowing events. This rapid shift in pressure would have catalyzed the formation of gas bubbles within the bloodstream, giving rise to the dreaded decompression sickness. This dire condition would have manifested in the form of embolisms, insidiously affecting critical organs such as the brain, heart, and other vital systems, further compounding the profound and tragic consequences of the submarine's catastrophic demise. From 0.9 to 1 millisecond, the mounting hydrostatic pressure from the surrounding water would have placed immense stress on the human body. Blood vessels would have collapsed and bodily fluids would have been forced out, contributing to the rapid deterioration of internal structures. 
Finally, from one millisecond and beyond, the submarine, now reduced to debris, would have continued to collapse under the intense pressure. The passengers' bodies would have become estranged within the wreckage. Inside the submarine, the air might have contained a concentration of hydrocarbon vapors. When the hull finally collapsed, the air would have spontaneously ignited, leading to a subsequent explosion following the initial rapid implosion. Temperatures would have soared dramatically, potentially reaching levels akin to the surface of the sun, up to 5,000 degrees Celsius. In an instant, the explosion would have engulfed all the crushed fragments, potentially reducing them to ashes and dust. As unfortunate as it would be, this disintegrated mass accumulating roughly 900 pounds, with the five individuals on board, each likely averaging 180 pounds, would seamlessly blend with the water, morphing into a poignant addition to the marine ecosystem and etching itself into the enigmatic catalog that endures beneath the deep, dark, and mysterious oceanic blues, continuing to fuel our explorations. Care to join us on this captivating journey? How do you think the aftermath of a submarine implosion affects the intricate cycle of life in the ocean depths? Share in the comments below and let's unravel the depths together. And if you haven't already, consider subscribing for more intriguing explorations.